Our title for the sermon for the day is Beholding the Love of God. So let's all stand up and read the gospel. Behold, bestowed in us. This hope in him purifies himself. May God bless us to the reading of his word. Please be seated. Uh, the picture you're looking at, or rather the painting you're looking at, is the painting of Paul Gauguin. The odd thing about this painting is that on the upper right side portion of the screen, are some words written to it. It's very rare that the painting would have a word on it. Okay? So Gauguin, in painting this picture in Tahiti, asked the following question. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? We're going to answer those questions or similar questions in our gospel today. The first verse reads, Behold, what manner of love the Father bestowed on us, that he should call us children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because he did not know him. The first word is behold. You know the Gospel of John is quite different from the other Gospel. John was looking at Jesus Christ from the inside. The other Gospel was looking at Jesus Christ from the outside. So John was looking at Jesus Christ not only as a man, but as God. So when he, and this Gospel was written when it was about 70, 80 years old. So he was quite old. So when he said, Behold, he was actually having a flashback in his mind on his experiences, experiences with Jesus when he was walking with Jesus on earth. So let's have a picture image of what is in John's mind at the time when he said, Behold. So John remembered, if you go to the Gospel of John, uh, Jesus was walking on the shore, and John the Baptist said, that is the Lamb of God. And because of that, John followed Jesus together with Andrew. And they stayed with Jesus for a while. And John remembered being invited with Jesus in the wedding of Cana. He changed the water into wine. And John remembered that as they, he was walking with Jesus, the centurion approached him begging for the life of his son. Heal my son. And the centurion, when he went home, the child was indeed healed. And John remembered the feeding of the 5,000. John also remembered the healing of the paralytic man who has been there for 30 years in the pool of Bestada. And John remembered Jesus saying, go to the other shore. And the disciples went to the other shore. There was a storm. And they the disciples saw Jesus walking on water. And when he boarded the boat, the boat was immediately transported to the shore. He remembered that. And John remembered Jesus Christ healing the blind man. And of course, who can forget Jesus Christ shouting, Lazarus, come forth. 
And he remembered Jesus washing his feet and all the other disciples, including Judas. Somebody help me over there. So. And John was amazed about the sovereignty of God, that God was in control of everything. Remember when Jesus was arrested? John and Peter was following him. And the word says, because Peter cannot enter the gate, another disciple who was known to the priest said to the girl, let Peter come in. And who is that other disciple? John. John, God made sure that John will be an eyewitness to the trial of Jesus. He witnessed the blow-by-blow mock kangaroo trial of Jesus. In fact, John was the only disciple at the foot of the cross. And he, he remembered Jesus looking at him and said, Son, this is your mother. Mother, addressing Mary, this is your son. And he remembered Jesus' shout, it is finished, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And then he remembered Mary Magdalene running to the disciple, saying that Jesus is alive. And so he ran with Peter, and he saw an empty tomb. And John remembered Jesus, in his glorified body, entered the upper room where the disciples were cowering in fear because this leader were cruci was crucified. He never knocked on the door, he just went in, in his glorified body. In fact, he went there a second time because Thomas was there. And he said, come here, Thomas. Put your finger on my side. And Thomas shouted, my God, my Lord and my God. And he remembered a few days after Jesus calling on the disciples to cast their net on the other side. And they caught, caught about 150 and one fish. And Peter ran to Jesus, and he saw Jesus broiling fish for him for breakfast. And thereafter, Jesus ascended into heaven. And of course, how could John forget what Jesus said about himself? When Moses was looking at the burning bush, he asked God, what should I tell your people? What is your name? How do we call you? And God said, I am who am. And when Jesus was at earth, he said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hungry. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the vine. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. In other words, Jesus was saying, I am God in the flesh. I am God. Now, when we say behold, we have to examine ourselves. Behold means there is extreme amazement, an extreme feeling of gratitude for what God has done for us. 
The question is, do we behold God or do we trivialize Him? Are we as amazed as John that we and worthy sinners, the God of the universe, died for us? Do we value His love or do we trivialize His love? You know, there are two kinds of people that attend church. The first are those who are who committed so many sins, like me. They feel so unworthy of God. They feel so inadequate to serve God. They feel so weak. They have no strength to serve God. But these are the people whose, whose sin abounds, that grace abounds even more. Because they value God. They're going to hell and God stopped them. Not because they are, they're good, but because God simply chose to love them and worthy as they are. So they value God. The other attendees of the church are not as bad. They come from a good family. In fact, they know the Bible. They attend so many seminars. In fact, sometimes they preach. So, they have so many ministries, in fact. So, subconsciously or consciously, they think that they're doing well. They deserve God. And they think that God owes them something. So, they don't value what God has did, did for them. Everyone is going to hell. But God called out from heaven and said, I choose to love you. No one, no one is worthy of salvation. The irony in Christian life is that the more you feel unworthy, like the publican in the temple when he cannot look up, he said, I am not worthy of you, God. I am a sinner. The way Peter looked at himself and he said, get away from me, Lord. I am not worthy of you. I am a sinner. The more you consider yourself unworthy, the more you, you, you feel so inadequate to serve him, the more you are dependent on him, the more you feel so weak to serve him, then his strength is made perfect in your weakness. But the other type, who are not as bad as us, as me, would take God's love for granted because they think they deserve their salvation. They walk around in an, in an air of self-righteousness. Anyway, I deserve this something. But if they don't receive the blessing that they prayed for, then they get disappointed because they think God owes them something. So the question is, do we behold God's love? Who is loving us? The one who loves us is God. Remember God? The God who created the universe? The God that gives you air to breathe? The God that controls every atom and nanoparticles in the universe that nothing moves without His permission? Remember God? The God who holds everything in creation together. That's why the sun orbits in a specific path. That's why the earth orbits and all the other stars orbits and the path and dictated by God. That is the God that loves you and loves me as a sinner. So John was amazed. In 
what manner of love does the Father bestow on, on us? He said. And the word says, for God so loved the world that he has to give up his son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. But God shows his love for us that while we are still sinners, not as good person, but still sinners, Christ died for us. That is the manner God. That is the love of God that God has bestowed in us. In fact, he said in Ephesians, he has blessed us in Christ with all the spiritual blessings available in heaven for us. And he chose to love us even before the foundation of the world. He chose to love us, me, you, before he, he even created us. It is a love that is incomprehensible. Not only that, he adopted us to be his children, destined to go to Christ. That is the manner of love that God has for us. Do we deserve that? Of course not. Of course not. But he simply chose to love us. And there's more. He called us to be his children. He gives us a new identity in Christ. So what is a children supposed to be? What is a child supposed to be? He said in his words, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. So we are now children. So are we only spoiled brats interested in his blessing? Or do we identify in the suffering, crucifixion, and death of Jesus Christ? It says, I have been crucified with Christ, Paul says. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in my body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So Paul said, to live is Christ, to die is gain. <clears throat> in the same manner that we share in his glory, we must also share in his suffering. We are not spoiled brats. And why do we suffer? What's the purpose of pain? The purpose of pain is to test you and me as to whether or not we will love God despite our pain. If we love God only in blessing, then we don't really love God. We're spoiled brats. I will love you if you will answer all my prayers. But I will not love you if you make me unhappy. The purpose of pain and suffering is so that God can work all things all things in our life for our good and for his glory and in the process we are conformed to the image of his son Jesus Christ that is the only purpose of our creation to glorify God only when we are conformed to the image of our Savior Jesus Christ we have no other purpose in creation but to glorify God. And therefore, since we are children of God, the world doesn't know us. Why? Because there are only two kinds of people in the world. The children of God and the children of Satan. Certainly the children of Satan will hate the children of God. God chose us and set us apart from the world. We have different values. We are not citizens of this world. We are citizens of heaven. Everything we will leave behind. We will leave behind.
And he said in his word, Here I am, I come to do your will. He set aside the first covenant to establish the second one. And by that, we have been made holy to the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. And when Jesus was praying at the garden before he was crucified, he was praying, my prayer is that you take them out. Them refers to us, the believers in Christ. That my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of this world. We are not of this world. Even as I am not, Jesus was not of this world. Sanctify them, us, by the truth. Your word is truth. As you set me into the word, I have set them into the word to spread your love. Protect them. And Jesus says, the one that hate, the word hate, he hated me first. What do you expect? We are children of God. So we are supposed to be hated by the world. He said, you will be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm on the faith to Jesus Christ will be abundantly rewarded in heaven. But, you know, that is not what is happening today. This is the last days, remember? In Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, it says, people will be lovers of self. In this last days, they would like to hear sermons that pleases their ego, that you know, appeals to their itching ears. You know? They don't want hard sermons like hell, sin. You know? So, this is what A.W. Tosser said about the new cross of Christianity. You know, remember Jesus? He was crying, I have a cross. But, you know, modern Christianity, if it is Christian at all, invented a new cross for us. It says, from this new cross has sprung a new philosophy of Christian life. And from that new philosophy, has come a new evangelical technique, a new type of meeting, and a new kind of preaching. This new evangelism employs the same language, Christianist language, as the old, but its content is not the same, and its emphasis is not the same. In other words, they are more into prosperity, into God's love for us, it's okay if you don't read the Bible. It's okay. It's okay if you don't pray. It's okay. God understands. It's okay if you don't prioritize your career over God. It's okay. It's okay. God understands because God loves you. In fact, other evangelistic church just would say there's no hell. Because how can a loving God condemn you? In the men's ministry, we are studying about cult, cult rather. But there's an insidious cult, which is the prosperity, this kind of religion. That there's no, it is a Christianity without the cross, Christianity without repentance. That is what is being sold to us, because it's popular. It is man-centered rather than God-centered. You do all these practices, you can, you can drink, you can commit all those, you can go to cabaret, burlesque, or whatever. It's okay, because God understands, because God loves you. So, Tosu said, the new cross encourages a new and different evangelistic approach. The evangelist does not demand abnegation of the old life before a new life can be received. He preaches not contrast, but similarities. If there's no repentance, it's okay. 
there's no there's no running away from sin. It's okay. God forgives you. God understands you. He seeks to key into public interest by showing that Christianity makes no unpleasant demands. O nga naman, ano? Christianity demands that you read the Bible. You must read the Bible. If you are truly a child of God, you have a hunger to know Him through His world. Not in any other books or any other seminars. No! It is the Bible. Because the Bible is living and powerful. It is on the only book available to us to transform our lives. You can attend so many seminars retreat. No, if you don't know the Bible, you do not know God. You do not know God. There's no demand for prayer. There's no demand for self dying to self. It's always about man, not about God. So the new Christianity rather offers the same thing that the world does, but only on a higher level. Whatever the sin man word happens to be clamor clamoring after at the moment is cleverly shown to be the very thing the gospel offered. Only the religious product is better. In other words, you can enjoy all the sins that you want because God loves you. So it is a good religion. It's a religion that is that has to make you happy, that will entertain you, that will amuse you. And if it's no longer amusing and entertaining, you get out. Because the gospel is about God. It is not about you. Your greatest enemy is you. That's why Jesus Christ said, die to self. But the new evangelists, the new method is that they, they grow yourself. The very thing that God, Jesus Christ wants you to die in, to offer to the cross. But many fall for that. Many fall for that. Because easy. It is comfortable. It is convenient. If you you know the cross of Christ, he was he was carrying a heavy load. He stumbled. But the new Christianity, imagine this: the new Christian, his cross is quite large, but it's made of a styrofoam. It's only for display. Not display. And then he doesn't walk on the narrow uh, the on the gable road, the hard road. He, he walks to just Fairview Terraces, kasi medyo malamig din, eh. diba? And then he is fully clothed, kasi baka umitim siya, diba? May sun lotion, SP50, at tapos may sombrero pa, may eyeglasses, at tapos nabibigatang pa siya doon sa styrofoam, he puts a pillow here, and he has his assistant, come here, uh, no, open the umbrella, kasi mainit eh. Na? He carries his clothes around, and then he sees Starbucks, oh, hey, ah, taka, Starbucks muna ako. Ah, ito, so he throws his cross, he joins his friend, he takes coffee, latte, okay, very expensive, the same coffee that we serve here. Na? But it has the label, right? So, uh, proud tayo. Eh. So, dapat Starbucks. Okay. Oh, uh, time na. Cross na. Okay, he goes. The car is cross it up. And then, and my friends in a great. Okay. Oh, selfie tayo. Selfie. Yeah. Diba? Dapos, he walks around and said, Ay, oras na pala. I have to play my Dota. So, Dota pa siya. Diba? And then, I have to update my Facebook. You laugh at it, but this is us. 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 We are trivializing God's love for us. What we magnify are the trivial things of earth. We are so preoccupied in making money so that our children will, will not be poor. 
الكرير but he died you know the leadership has a great concern GCF has been here for about 70 years our pastor is quite new two years na siya dito we conducted the discipleship trap we have tests and we found out that 80% do not know the gospel. 80% do not know the basic doctrines of Christianity. We are crying over this. Pastor Boyet is crying over this. Imagine we are spending so much resources and every 80% of, of, of us are going to hell anyway. serious with God. Let us not waste his resources. GCF, the only purpose GCF is here is to make Christ known. And how do we know Christ? Reading his word and prayer. There is no other way so that we can be transformed and we become credible witnesses of making Christ known. But we have not gotten over this. Only very few people really know Christ. It's, it's encouraging that among the youth we have a spin here, Mickey. She treats. Yeah. The dome. They know the gospel. They understand the gospel. But we are disheartened that most of the youth do not know the gospel. And this, the presumption is because their parents have been the Christians for long, they should have known the gospel. But no. So, I encourage you, I beg you parents, when you go home, explain the gospel to your children. Explain the gospel to your children. You know, you, you are working so hard to give them a good inheritance so that they will not suffer. But all these things will... It's temporal. I am a, I'm a lawyer. My core practice is state planning. You know, you are a rich man. The mga anak ninyo, they just quarrel over you well. In fact, even baka in-laws mo pa ang magkakinabang dyan eh. Not, not your children. But the only legacy that you can give him must have an eternal value and that is the gospel. And there's no other way but the gospel. If that is the only thing you can give them, then give him them right now. Because anyway, we have a mansion in heaven. Everything that will not vanish. We will be with God. That is more important than all the things that we see here. This is just temporary. We will not take this. Make sure that your child will go to hell. So, we are children of God. But there is more. There is more. He says, what we are now, Children of God, there's something more. We will have the glorified body of Christ when God reveals himself to us. Remember when he went inside the upper room without opening the door? We will have that body when Christ comes to take us home. We will, we will travel to this with the speed of thought. Our senses are so heightened that we will enjoy God forever and ever and ever and ever and nothing can ever replace that. If you don't believe in God, you are shortchanging yourself. The 
And the word says, and those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly body that will be, that they will be like his glorious body. And that is the promise. Is it that worth everything more than what we have now? To be with Christ, our glorious body? There. That is a picture, image of what we will become. Christ will take us home. Our body is not built for heaven. We have to be changed to be suitable to heaven. Yeah. That is the hope that we have. Are you going to exchange that hope for trivial things on this earth? Are you so stupid to do that? Iba mga Pilipino, may parental complex. Magugulang tayo. Huwag tayo magpatalo sa satanas. Diba? This is what God offers us. And a, a, a beautiful life in heaven. So because of all of that, Christ's suffering, we behold him. We are children of God. He was going to give us a glorified body later on. Because all of that, while we wait for, for him, we must purify ourselves, keep ourselves holy because our God is holy. We must put to death ourselves. Get rid of our stupid practices, etc. Our lies. And put on our new self. We are now a new creation which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of our Creator. And the word says, since there Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence of God. And so, I na nalalab and so, I ask myself, why is it that Christians do not behold God? Why do they trivialize God's love? The truth is, we have not made God a reality in our life. God is not real to us. God is something supernatural, good thing, a good subject to talk about. The good idea, heaven is a good idea. Probably it is there, probably it is not. It is not a reality to us. Why? Why? Because we never read the Word of God, the Bible. The Word says, do not conform to the world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind and the only material that God has for us to tra transform our mind is the Bible. Read the Bible. I'm not talking as an, no, uh, theoretically. I experience it myself. I am a sinner. I'm the chief of all sinners. I'm a lawyer. I'm a liar, etc., etc., but I behold God's love precisely because of that. And when I read His word, which at, at, during the, the first time I was, re I was really trying to say that, that this is just a lot of philosophy. But when I continue to read it, then indeed, indeed, I am transformed. 
I am transformed. I am not perfect as I want to be. But I am better than I was. I am better than I was. In an occasion I said, I'm glad that I did not choose my friends and God chose my friends. Why? Because I will choose my friends. I will choose friends that may hear it in the burlesque, no Those are the kind of friends I was. If I can can get anything, di ako makikinabang sa'yo, bakit ako ipagkaibigan sa'yo? But through the reading of the Word, He transformed me. And I'm really glad that God chose my friend for me. And so, in order to be a child of God, you have to know the gospel. You can forget everything I said, but this is a gospel. It will determine whether you are going to hell or heaven. You might die when you get out of this church. You might die. Don't presume that you will be alive tomorrow. There's an urgency. Time is not on your hand. It's not under your control. You might die. So let the, the, the word says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. It's not what I say. It's the word of God that will save you. That will give you faith. So let's read 1 Corinthians 15, 3, 8. First Corinthians 15 to 28 establishes the factual basis of our faith. It says, Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. Everything that Christ did on earth was already predicted before he created the world. Everything is written in the Old Testament. God has only one plan, plan A. It is fulfilled. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. And on the third day, he was buried, and he arose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. Our Savior is alive, seated at the right hand of the Father, praying for us. Buddha is dead, Huma, Muhammad is dead, and all the other cults are dead, and they will die. But our Savior is alive in heaven. That's why we are able to establish a personal relationship with him. Because he is alive. That is our God. Let's read. And so it says, Jesus Christ died for our sins. His death justified us freely. It's a free gift. He redeemed us from the enemy, ransomed us. Jesus Christ died not only for us, but more importantly, he died to appease the wrath of his Father, to satisfy the attribute of God, because our God is perfectly just. His laws are perfect. So how can we, in perfect man, satisfy the perfect love, uh, perfect love of God, perfect justice of God? We cannot. 
That was, that's why Jesus Christ, the perfect man, needs to die for us. So that he will fulfill all the requirements of the law. And all we have to do is believe in him. And if we believe in him, his perfect righteousness will be imputed to us. That if the father looks at us, that that is my son. He has no sin. I see Christ. I see my son. And he did that for us, unworthy sinners. For us. For us. And this is the gospel. Let's read it. It says in Romans 10, 9, it says, Jesus is Lord. It means Jesus is not only our Savior. He is the one who should dictate how we should go. He is not the God of our own making. We have to surrender everything to Him. Our life. All that we have on earth. It is His. He is our Lord. Not only our Savior. Now if you really believe that, if you really committed to make Jesus Christ your Lord, not the genie that you can call on to fulfill all your desires, no, our Lord to serve and glorify while you are still alive. If you are serious about him because he's dead serious about us, he died for us. If you are serious about him, then you become a child of God. And to under, answer the question of God again, where did we come from? From God. Who are we? We are children of God. Where are we going? To God. And our only goal in life is that we meet him. He will say to us, good and faithful servant. That is our only goal in life. If we really believe him. Value his love. Treasure his love. Read the Bible. Know him through prayer. And if you really do that, then we can now start the abundant life here on earth on our way to heaven. And that beautiful journey with God begins. Let's pray. Father God, we're so sorry, Lord, that we have not given you the love that that we should that you deserve. In fact, we are so we cannot pay the debt that we owe you. So help us, Lord, because we are so weak. We want to obey you, Lord. We want to surrender our life to you, but we are weak, Lord. Empower us, Lord, with the Holy Spirit, so that we have a hunger for your word that we can pray to you because after all Lord we will die and we will see you Lord help us to get serious with you because you are dead serious with us you have blessed us so tremendously Lord 
but we don't want to identify with suffering, with inconveniences. Lord, make us what you want us to be. And we, you can only do that, Lord. You can, it's only you that can only do that through the power of the Holy Spirit, oh God. Revive the Holy Spirit in our hearts so that we will be worthy to become, to be called your children of God. We pray this, Lord, in the mighty name of your Son, Jesus.